A few months ago, I'm on a flight from Amsterdam to Accra, where I currently live. That's my official address when I'm there, and where I run an organization, the Women, Peace, and Security Network, focusing on enhancing women's capacity to get involved in peace and security leadership and governance in Africa. And I sit by this very big African man, and I'm really tired because I've been running a shift on this last trip. And by the time we take off and we're at a place where it's safe to, I said to him, sir, my sincere apologies. I'm changing my seat because I'm about to fall asleep. And I don't want to snore on you because you would go back and tell your people this pretty Liberian woman, because I assume I'm pretty, <laughs> snored on me from Amsterdam to Accra. And then he said, no, have a seat. I have a history with Liberia. And I looked at him, and it clicked. I know where I know this guy from. And so the conversation turns to Liberia and the war. And he said, you know, I'm credited. I'm one of those credited for bringing Liberians to Ghana as refugees. I worked in a committee, and he went on and on. He said, but you know, people like yourself were somewhere in Europe and America going to school, so you never really felt the war. See you fancy woman sitting in business class, KLM. And I looked him straight in the eye, as I've been taught by one of my African sisters, and said, sir, you don't know me. You don't know my story. And don't even think for a moment that you know me. I say, I know you. I'm one of those Liberian girls who came as a refugee in 1990, September 3rd, to be exact, on the Kano River ship. We slept at the Teman port under heavy rain for a night. We went to the Buduburam camp. And I lived there for a year, very angry, and went back home. And he looked at me, and I said, I also know you. And I told him some of the things that he did. Not very pleasant. And he couldn't say a word. But my story is not an ordinary story. It's not unique to Liberia. It's an ordinary story, and it's not an ordinary story, and it's not unique to Liberia. It's a story in Cote d'Ivoire. It's the story in Congo DRC. It's the story in Somalia currently. The story of any girl going through the process of war. In 2003, my story continued from 1989 to 2003. Fresh out of high school, straight A student, aspiring to be a doctor. That's the story of some girl in some place, somewhere in this world. The name Liberia had become synonymous with war. The nation had been embroiled in the worst civil wars that Africa had seen. The effect of the war on the livelihood of women and children is something that we cannot express in words. We tried, women tried in the early days of the wars to get involved. But in 2003, ordinary women who had bared or bore the brunt of the war from 1989 up to 2003 observed their children being raped, had been rape victims also, beaten, homes taken away, internally displaced, refugee, decided we would step out. And for us, we really didn't have any idea of what King and Gandhi did when they protested. All we knew, we, like people would go to an insurance company in this country and say, I am doing a life insurance so that when I die, my children have something to fall back on. Or as you would do your retirement plan, when we step out, that was our plan. Survivor. We needed to survive. Our children needed to see a future beyond war. 
And we were asking of those who were killing us three simple things. Immediate unconditional ceasefire, go to a peace talks, and please, to the international community, send us a, a um, intervention force. We protested like mad people. We were all over the place, and a friend said, every time she saw us, she said, wow, these women have taken the madness pill this morning because we were all over the place, putting our already broken bodies out there to protest. In 2003, a peace agreement was signed. We decided we would not step back, but continue to remain in the forefront for peace. We mobilized women, and I tell people we got a crown, and that crown was Africa's first elected female president. That was the crown for the hard work. People would always ask, <laughs> what were the challenges of mobilizing women? The first challenge we faced as we did the work that we did was religious divide. The world that we live in now tend to emphasize more on the divide than the similarities. I would speak directly to this country that has just celebrated 10 years of 9-11. And in 10 years, I don't have authority on American history or American political life, but what I know of the day-to-day -day life is that in 10 years, the divide in this country has been emphasized to the point that it's so thick, you can't see through the humanity of the other and see through the humanity of yourself. So our first challenge was to tear down the religious divide because our protest was predominantly made of Christians and Muslims. Some of the Christian women came and quoted scriptures to us. What fellowship does light have with darkness? And we had to work through those things. We also had to break through the factional and ethnic divide. Liberia has a history of American Liberians versus indigenous descents of the free slaves versus those who were there. So we had to work through those, but we also had to work through the factional divide because the different rebel groups represented different ethnic groups and women saw their identity in those groups. So we had to tell them beyond a victory, a military victory for your ethnic group, there is a greater victory of peace for the next generation. We were operating from within a, a police state. Taylor had guns over our heads, but we're stepping out every morning and saying, the option of sitting back is higher than the option of dying, and we were prepared to die. We had the elite rural divide to penetrate through. One of the things that when we jumped into this protest, we didn't know was the cost of protesting. So we thought it was easy. But then by the time we realized we needed 1,000 US dollars a day, it became a very difficult thing. One final thing that was the hallmark of the work that we did was thinking on our feet. And this has brought me to the realization that it has nothing to do with your level of education. Once you have passion and commitment for any cause, you can make a difference. <laughs> At the end of the day, the successes, we created awareness, we gave a human face to our conflict, we pressured our government and they went to the table. We sustained the action for two years. We breached the religious gap. And we raise funds in country. I'm proud to stand here to say that at the time we were protesting, we didn't know of a CGI. We didn't know of a Daphne Foundation. We heard of a Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, but our cash came from ordinary women. Children going to school and bringing five Liberian dollars and saying, use this to buy water. At the end of the first six months, we recorded 65,000 US dollars from in country. <laughs> what are some of the lessons that we learned along the way? Tolerance, commitment, and perseverance. With all these major values, our work would not have started, it would not have continued, and despite the odds, we were able to overcome. So the question is presently, where is Liberia? I talked about Africa's first female president. 
Liberia has moved from a country where in 2006 our national budget was $80 million. In 2011, our national budget is $369 million. Liberia is a country that had a reserve of $5 million in 2006. Today we have a reserve of $293 million. It may sound very small, but these are huge steps for people coming out of 14 years of war. In 2009, from 2006 to 2009, we had a debt of $4.9 billion. Today, Liberia is debt free. There are challenges. Adult literacy is as high as 55.5%. 68% live below the poverty line. 65% unemployment rate key among young people. But we also have some things that we, we celebrate. We have one of the strongest rape law in Africa. We now have an inheritance law that recognizes rural women's right to inherit properties from their husbands. We also have a policy, national policy now on sexual abuse and exploitation. There are different things that have been going on as it relates to the work that we do and bringing women together. During the years of this journey called peace activism, what we learned what we saw, what we endured, is something that words cannot depict. New friends were made, old friendship became stronger, enemies were converted into friends. As women, we cried many times, joke and laugh, to relieve the stress that was associated with the work that we did. We danced, we started a campaign called No More War. But today, my point to you, and my challenge to you, as people are giving challenges out there, as global citizens of this world, it is important for all of us to make silent vows. People always ask me, what can I do for your cause? And these last few days, I've turned that question around. Even though we need cash for the work that we do, even though we need different things in our countries, but the question, every time I turn it around, I ask people, what can you do for your community? There are inner cities, gang violence, gun violence, what can you do? Are we, the good people of this world, sitting back and allowing evil to take over our spaces? Are we, the good people of this world, prepared to step up and say no more to rape in the Congo, and not just say it in paper, but make our presence felt? This is a very powerful community of people that can make a lot happen. How can we change the dynamics? My plea, so you all, and my challenge to you all is to step out and do something. No matter how tiny that step may be, the legacy that it leaves is big and is, it can be great. I'll leave you with the words of Harriet Tuckman, something that leapt off the page as I read Hillary Clinton's book in 2003. If you are tired, keep going. If you're hungry, keep going. If you're scared, keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, keep going. Global citizens, let's raise our voices to alert the world that we will keep going until we win the struggle for lasting peace, social justice, and gender equality. Thank you.